Good afternoon. Hello. So I'm going to be talking about growing distributed systems. I'm Bryce Curley. I work for Basho. We make the React distributed database. And my Twitter name is Bonzo Esk, as you can see on the screen right here. If I start rattling off uh, links or URLs, you don't need to write them down. I collected them all for you, and I'll show you one URL for that all at the end. Uh, first things, I live in Miami. This is my office all winter, and that's a uh, coffee. I went to Bend, Oregon last month for another conference, and this is what the weather was like. It's really, really dreary. Uh, there are ducks. There's not a lot of leaves or green stuff, a lot of brown stuff, and a lot of rain. <laughs> they have these little public stocks where they keep books. Uh, you can go pick up a book if you want or just look at them. But now I'm here in sunny Brazil. Uh, so this was me about halfway through yesterday. And actually I went after this and spent another couple hours out. Uh, so this was me this morning. <laughs> But I'm going to be talking about distributed systems and what even are distributed systems. It's hard to know. They're really, like, it's a nebulous concept. Uh, one definition is you could say that they're a computer system that doesn't fit in one single computer. Another definition is that they're computer systems that are always broken. And they aren't necessarily always completely broken, but they're never completely not broken. And they're expected to work with some amount of breakage. Another definition uses uh, light cones in that they're a computer system where the amount of time any information takes to move from place to place is a significant factor in the design and usability of it. So does anybody here play online games like Team Fortress or Call of Duty or anything? OK. And you're probably familiar with the concept of lag from these games. So here we have a red soldier and a blue sniper. And the blue sniper has a much better lag to the server than the soldier does. So the soldier jumps out into where the sniper can see him, and he can see the sniper. Whenever they see each other, they both shoot their guns at each other at the same time. Well, that doesn't actually happen. The sniper shoots as soon as he sees the soldier, and the soldier takes a couple seconds to sort of react to seeing the sniper and aim and etc. From the server's point of view, it sees that the sniper shot first, and then it saw that the soldier shot back at the sniper. So from the soldier's point of view, one way to interpret this is they shoot and then they die. From the sniper's point of view, they shoot the soldier before they get a shot off, and then they explode. Another point of view, which a lot of games have moved to in the last 10 years, is that the server knows when each player receives a message and tries to make something that makes sense out of it, instead of penalizing the user with the most lag. This is really, really hard, and it leads to a lot of unintuitive experiences. So the sniper shoots the soldier as soon as they see them, and explode. It's a sort of weird setup, but it's a, uh, it feels more fair in the long run. A classic quote about distributed systems is they're computer systems where the failure of a computer you don't know exists can break your computer. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about the rules and theory for how distributed systems operate, what inconsistency and unavailability mean, and how to make your Rails app a better distributed system. One classic distributed systems problem is the Byzantine generals. So there are two generals. Each general has an army. And they're on either sides of a town. They have to agree to attack this town at the same time, so attack at 9 AM. Otherwise, the town will beat one army, and the town will beat the next army, and both generals lose. If they both attack at the same time, they win. The problem is they didn't have WhatsApp. They had horse messengers. <laughs> and the problem with horse messengers is that you can intercept these messages. So if one army sends a messenger to the other army that says attack at 9, they don't know 
if that messenger got there and if the other army agrees, if the other army sends another messenger back confirming it, if that message gets intercepted, they don't know if the other army no is going to attack at the same time. If they both send 100 horse messengers, that's 100 like, uh, cavalrymen that won't be in their armies attacking the town, and it takes a lot of time. And there's a really, really big trade-off reaching this consensus on when to attack. And the right answer is there isn't a right answer. You have to decide the trade-offs. Other distributed systems problems involve criticality, or this sort of state where if one thing breaks, the whole system in trying to react to this breakage will fall down. So on a Sunday in July 2008, Amazon S3, one server had a single bit error in one message, and the other server sort of kicked off a whole bunch of other protocols to other servers saying, I'm confused. And all these other servers did the same thing, saying, I'm confused, to every S3 server in the world. And Amazon's ops team reacted to this in about half an hour, and they decided they had to shut down S3 and then start it from scratch. S3 is a lot of servers. There's thousands all over the world. How do you even do that? And the, the blasé answer is very carefully. <laughs> In December 2012, GitHub had a uh, file server replication where they have server pairs, one active that receives write requests and read requests, and one passive member that just receives read requests. And they sort of had a network glitch that caused messages from one server to the other to corrupt. And what happened was these servers saw they had corrupt messages, and they have a protocol called uh, shoot the other node in the head, or stoneth for short. And what happened was both nodes, both the master and the uh, worker node, or active and the passive node, would see that the other node was acting up, send a message to the other node to shut down. These messages would go through and both nodes would shut down. And they were no longer serving requests. And some of them, neither message got through, so they both thought they were the active server and served write requests and got this sort of inconsistent state between the two. And it took them, I think, the better part of a weekend to get back up and running, but it took them over a week to get back up to full speed with everything correct because they had to go in and fix a lot of these little inconsistencies that had built up. And finally, the northeastern US power grid in 2003 a power line got overloaded by too many people running air conditioners and incandescent lights and touched a tree. And the power line uh, software that runs it said, this power line just touched a tree. I'd better shut down before a fire starts or something terrible happens. And what happens is all the load that was moving over that line gets sent to other power lines but so much goes to other power lines that they get overloaded and shut down too. And eventually Toronto, New York, Washington DC, and places as far south as Atlanta lost a lot of power service. And New York is a big city. And they went, I think, the better part of a day without any power, including rush hour. People in New York had to get out of their cars into intersections and direct traffic. Otherwise, it just would have been gridlocked. So this is what happens when you build a system that has interconnections and safety protocols that may or may not work as expected. And this is all sort of just Murphy's Law at scale, where where you have more stuff happening, your little tiny errors build up. So who here has lost a hard drive to a crash? How often does that happen? Once every year, once every two years? What happens if you have 10,000 hard drives? You end up replacing them every day. At any given time, Backblaze, they do a uh, backup service in the cloud. They have 40 dead hard drives right now that they just haven't got around to replacing with working ones yet. 
Gears of War 2 was a uh, multi-million selling Xbox game. And during testing, they had 40,000 hours of people testing it in multiplayer to make sure that the game worked and didn't have glitches. In the first 15 minutes after it came out, the player base put in more than that in actual gameplay. And over the first weekend, there were bugs and problems found that never came out during testing, just because there's so many people when you serve a lot of customers. And what I feel is the most important rule in distributed systems these days is called the CAP theorem. So you have consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. And you can't, or you do pick two, but you can't not pick partition tolerance. So you have to compromise. Everybody wants a reliable, consistent, distributed system. I also want to play basketball like LeBron James and for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers to win the Super Bowl. That's not going to happen. I have to you know, choose what I want. So that's the sort of rules and theory about how distributed systems work. Next, I'll be talking about the CAP theorem and what inconsistency and unavailability actually are. So the CAP theorem, consistency, availability, partition tolerance. The problem is every system has partitions. And you just have to choose that whenever something can't talk to something else, do you want to be less correct? or not work at all. So when I say every system has partitions, the really dramatic version is that somebody doing road construction or something, they grab with this construction equipment, they grab a fiber optic line and it breaks. It's not necessarily like that. This is certainly a big issue, but the more common issue is the internet just gets sad on a you know, huge scale. Like if there's a little bit of latency or a little bit of packet loss, this is a huge issue. So whenever you talk about systems that are affected by the CAP theorem, you have both AP or available, or available and partition tolerant, or CP or correct or consistent and partition tolerant. <laughs> Zookeeper, part of the Apache project, is a consistent and partition tolerant system. Whenever so zookeepers used to keep a consistent state or configuration between servers in different data centers. So if you had data centers in Sao Paulo and London and Tokyo, you would have a zookeeper in each, in each data center. And whenever you had, if London lost their connection to Tokyo and Sao Paulo, you could still do stuff successfully in Sao Paulo and Tokyo, and London would say, I can't get other nodes to vote on what happens, and I'm just going to not work. If all three nodes lose their connection to each other, none of them will work, and you won't fill any requests. Sometimes this is OK. So if I'm trying to sign up a Twitter account, and I'm on like a minority node, I can't just take somebody else's name, in this case, Lucas's name, because somebody else might have that name and I just can't find out because the network hasn't relayed that fact to me. And I'm sorry in advance for this plug, but REAC, the database I work on, is a available partition tolerance system. So whenever the system breaks partially, you can still write to it and you can still read from it. The catch is that you'll read kind of wrong answers. And one example you see a lot is YouTube's. So whenever you click like on a YouTube video, it adds to a counter. Whenever you watch a YouTube video, it adds to a counter. Sometimes the counters don't update at the same time. So you can see a video that has like 30 views, and then you know 1,000 people have liked it, which doesn't make sense until you realize that something at YouTube is always broken, and the counters are part of that. What's really valuable, then, is having some kind of database where you can choose whether you want it to be consistent or available. And one option is to just run like Postgres, which is consistent, and React, which is not. You can get consistency where you need it and availability where you need it. So going back to the YouTube example, you don't want to load up a YouTube and not see these counters. 
you'd kind of rather see a wrong counter. But at the same time, you don't want to sign up for Twitter and steal uh, Lucas's name. And in the next version of React, which is coming soon, we have a strong consistency option. No idea when, that's, when we're actually going to release it, but soon. So that's what inconsistency and unavailability are. Next, I'm going to be talking about building a distributed Rails application, which is actually pretty easy. You already do it. So you think Rails application. It's a box, and I wrote Rails in it, and this is what I run. But it's not like that. You, sort, you have the web front end, so users on their cell phones, or users on like internet at the office, or on conference internet. And they see something different from what the server sees. And at the same time, your application has a database that takes time to get state from the database to Rails. You can have a lot of fun issues there if you have like a Rails uniqueness validation that's not enforced in the database and users can both hit submit at the same time and get something weird happening. And this is where SQL is really nice. So with SQL, you can write unique indexes and you can write constraints. And SQL, not only does SQL rule, SQL has rules. Most NoSQL databases don't have this sort of rules concept. Uh, Mongo, React, uh, I don't know if Orango does. But they don't have a constraint that says, in this document or in this node, you can't do this if some other node has done it. And this is valuable. It allows NoSQL databases to make a lot of concessions to rules to work on a lot of other valuable features, like running on multiple nodes or running in multiple data centers and having the whole thing work. So there's a temptation, then, to build all of these rules all this business logic, all these validations, build it right into your Rails models. And this is a pattern called monorail. And the problem with this monorail pattern is that now you have more and more code in your Rails app, and it gets harder to work with, and all of you have a lot of connections and coupling between different models that make it hard to work. And the cure for this is a service-oriented architecture which we heard a lot about in the Yammer talk, where you build lots of small services that do one thing. You extract parts from your monolithic monorail application and put them in separate apps that have the one data store they need and the business logic and expose a documented protocol for how other apps or the you know, monorail you just pulled this out of interact with it. The other benefit to this is you have a smaller deployment. So instead of having to bring down the shopping cart, the product list, the Twitter integration, et cetera, to do a new deployment, you bring down the shopping cart in waves. You like pull half the shopping carts down, update them, and then set them live, and then do the same to the other part. And you can do zero downtime deploys or zero zero downtime that your users actually notice deploys. It's also simpler from an organization or a management point of view. So what Twitter does whenever they have multiple systems, they say that this one engineer has pager duty this week. So if there's a problem with this system, the ops people don't necessarily have to know how everything works. They know who to call when one part breaks. So if the timeline goes down, they call person A. If the uh, who to follow goes down, they call person B. And they don't have to mutually know about every other service that Twitter runs. They just have to know about how their own works. Another huge advantage is that you sort of break the coupling. So it's really, really tempting whenever you have a lot of code in one application to say, I know how this works internally, and I'm going to rely on that. And the other code becomes harder to change because if you change model A, model B will break for some incomprehensible reason until you read about it. What you can do instead is whenever you go service oriented, you have this sort of flexible implementation that as long as your APIs work, you can rely on the fact that other services that depend on you will continue to work. How do you test this? Unit testing, same as always. 
test the models in each independent service. These are mostly there for the developer's benefit. You also write service level tests, or what you would call integration tests in Rails, where you pull out a service and you write a test that acts like a client to that service and makes all the requests necessary that your customers do or that your coworkers do and make sure they return correct results. And finally, acceptance testing, where you run through the whole stack, the whole service. This is really hard in a distributed system because it, you may touch 30 or 40 systems. And one thing that's really common is testing in production. There's a really great talk, and it's online from Big Ruby uh, a couple months ago called Refactoring GitHub with Science. And I have the link at the end. But it talks about how GitHub, whenever they add new version or new features, they test them by running both the old code and the new code, timing out how long both sides take and if they produce different results, and then show the old version to the user. And this allows them a lot of flexibility and sort of removing fear from the fact that their new code may break something. Finally, I'll talk about how apps work offline. So you're offline a lot. Being on a slow internet connection is kind of like being offline. Having a server or a client take time for garbage collection is kind of offline. Packet loss, airplane rides, not having internet where you are, just flat out being offline. The way you have to do this is smarter clients. And this has become a really big deal since iPhone and Android have got really big, where people will write a native app. And JavaScript is also picking up a lot of the slack. So you're already doing a lot of this offline app stuff. The hard part is just figuring out how to synchronize data and resolve conflicts when two offline users change the same resource in different ways. One strategy is called a operational transform. So this was sort of developed at Google to support Google Wave, if anybody ever used Google Wave. <laughs> but it still lives on in the Google Docs and Google Spreadsheet stuff. And what it basically does is whenever you make a change, it sort of queues up your changes and remembers the different states or the different like setups, configurations of the document that you move through as you make these changes. Then when it sends those to the server, it takes its existing state and replays each state change of yours on top of it and relays both the new state and the transformations to get there back to you. It's really, really complicated. I was trying to implement this over a weekend and I basically got to the part where I realized I could not do it in a weekend. Git is another very, very popular offline uh, sort of strategy for doing things offline. And what you do is you, both, you just remember each version of the document or of the project. And you can derive the changes from each version, but there's still with Git a lot of manual merging. You can work around this by using, and this is way out of scope for what we have time to talk today, uh, convergent replicated data types. And you can find me later and I will talk your ear off about them. Uh, but those are really easy to merge and computers can merge them deterministically. And the last one I'd like to talk about is Vesper. It's a note-taking app for iPhone and the developer Brent Simmons is adding sync to it. And he's doing a great job of blogging his thoughts, his ideas and rationalization for how he's writing it. And it's a fantastic series of blogs and I'll have the link for you in a few minutes. So I've talked about rules and theory. I've talked about what consistency, availability, and inconsistency and unavailability are, and how to make Rails distributed. So the big lessons here is that Ruby works. You can implement all the distributed stuff you need in Ruby. It's not too slow. It's not too unreliable. It works amazingly well, and you can build great stuff quickly. And you do need to build great stuff. You don't need to go distributed if you don't have any users. So get users, make them happy, make them invite their friends. You can always grow later when you need to. And there's so many resources online for you to figure out how to grow. 
that it's very, very easy. So that's sort of my main line of slides. I have some bonus slides if anybody's curious. I'm Bryce. The link that you want to write down is bit.ly.com slash APRB minus D-I-S-T. And I'm Bonzoesque on Twitter. My email's bcurly at bricecurly.net or Google my name. Any questions so far? Okay, I'll kill a couple minutes on my bonus slides. <laughs> So this is the best thing I saw in Bend. Uh, so it's always raining there, and somebody had a yellow house with a leather couch on their front porch getting wet all the time. And I wish I could care that little about anything. <laughs> so the uh, consistent partition tolerance systems are built using consensus algorithms. And one from about 25 years ago is called Paxos. Paxos has a big problem in that nobody knows how it works. So the uh, Diego Angaro and John Osterhout designed a new algorithm called Raft, which you can actually comprehend. And this just came out last year. There are a lot of great resources about it, and I have the links to them. Two big concepts are harvest and yield. And these are sort of the other side of the cap theorem, where harvest is how much data you get, and yield is your probability that your request will succeed with any harvest at all. Uh, so a available partition tolerance system sacrifices harvest, you'll get less data. And a consistent system sacrifices yield, so you may just get an error. One big problem that Twitter had, so originally whenever you got a new tweet, it would take the ID number of the previous tweet, add one to it, and put that on your tweet. The problem is once your tweets start coming in fast enough, the time it takes you to take the previous one and add one to it is longer than you have before the next tweet comes in. So they had to have a different way of assigning a unique number to every tweet. So they got rid of auto increment. Uh, SQL is acid or atomic, consistent, isolated, and durable. With no SQL, you have base, the opposite of acid, which is basically available it's soft state and it's eventually consistent. And that's all I have. So if you have any more questions, ask now. Otherwise, find me later. All right, thanks again.